you. Thanks, Don, for inviting me, and thank you all for having me. I am the Janice Cleveland that is up there. I do work at Cascadia. I've been a nurse for 23 years, and the first half was kind of in medical, post-surgical. I had to get all that under my belt, but found that my passion was was mental health. So I've been doing that the last 12 years. Who here uh, can't say they are, are not working with someone who's been traumatized in the past? Who here have, can say they themselves have not been traumatized in the past, right? So we're going to talk a little bit about understanding the neurobiology, the physiology, and the, the brain stuff about trauma. And then we'll move into talking a little bit about what we can do. How, what are some things we can do that will make it easier for folks who have kind of a trauma brain um, to learn stuff and to grow and on that road to recovery. So trauma-informed care, what is it? Basically, we understand trauma as being <coughs> Something sustained earlier, states of development, and it actually makes these brain changes and physiological changes that I just talked about, and then really exaggerated responses um, for stress and anxiety. And what I like to say is just assume that 100% of the people that we work with have been traumatized in one way, shape, or form, not only in their past as they're growing up, but also trying to get to the system is traumatizing in itself. Think about those who've been in and out of the <laughs> Secluded, restrained, forced meds. Yeah? So just assume that most of the people you're working with have definitely been traumatized. And basically, the definition of trauma informed care is this it's mental health treatment that incorporates a high appreciation for the prevalence of traumatic experiences in the individuals who receive mental health services. And <clears throat> it's a system of care that has a really good, thorough understanding of the profound neurological, biological, psychological and social effects of trauma and violence on the individual. We got to get on the same page about what trauma is. The experience of violence and victimization, including all of these things, sexual abuse, physical abuse, neglect, loss, violence, witnessing of domestic <coughs> violence. And of course, what's more prevalent in this day and age, right now, especially some disasters, right? And terrorism. And of course, we know that the person's response does involve that intense fear and a lot of helplessness. There's just this real feeling of helplessness, and we'll get into why. And of course, then you have somebody with trauma issues. They get overwhelmed very, very easily. So let's first talk about the relationship between adverse childhood experiences and adult health. Everybody know about the ACEs study? Yeah, we're more familiar with that, right? So to recap, it's definitely one of the largest studies ever done. And Kaiser Permanente and the CDC got together and did this. And it was about 17,000 people that were involved. These are the questions that they were asked. Have you experienced the following? The physical, emotional, or sexual abuse, neglect, divorce, all, all these um, traumatizing things. <coughs> family members in prison. So here's the interesting piece. Look at these numbers. What's wrong? with the cross-section of people here. 80% white, and they said including Hispanic, and 10% black, 10% Asian, 50% it was half and half men and women, 74% had attended college, and 62% were age 50 or older. That's what we wanted, people in their 50s to figure out how this affected their life. But boy, is that a skewed uh, cross-section of the population. So as we go through these numbers, I want to think about the fact that we, we know it's a fact that minorities have less access to care, right? And they're not even included in here. So our numbers would really be a lot higher in the traumatized population. So just keep that in mind. Out of the people that um, were in this study, one in four were exposed to at least two categories of faces. One in 16 was exposed to four. 22% were sexually abused as children. 66% of the women experienced abuse, violence, or family strife in childhood. And the study came out and said women were 50% more likely than men to have experienced five or more. Now, does that mean men aren't as traumatized as women? Aren't men notorious under-reporters about things like, like this? And, and, you know, you're looking at people who are over 50, and that's in 1998. 
So they come from that culture of, no, you don't manage and care of myself. So there's probably a lot more men suffering out there than we, than we realize. The other thing found in this study is there is a positive linear, linear correlation between ACEs and all these health problems. <coughs> the higher the ACE score, the more things that they said, yes, I've witnessed or been a part of, the higher the risk for these diseases, or they already have these diseases. I mean, look at this. Smoking, COPD, hepatitis, cardiac disease, diabetes, fractures, obesity, alcoholism, and it goes on. And all the way up to early death. Folks who have been severely traumatized and are in the mental health system and struggling die about 20 years earlier than the average. I'm not going to say normal because that's just a setting on my dryer at home. What is normal, right? An average adult. So and now you're going to see why that is. We'll, we'll get into some more details. There's also, of course, a positive, co positive correlation between ACEs and alcoholism. So there was a, a high ACE score that predicts alcohol abuse, and as we you would think, and the presence of alcohol abuse in the family increased the likelihood of sexual and physical abuse. And there was also a correlation between ACEs and suicide, suicide attempts and suicidal ideation. We know that depression affects 19 million Americans. 20, less than 25%, less than 25% have access to care. So think about how many people out there are not getting the treatment and the support that they need. Depression right now is one of the leading causes of disability in the U.S. And the studies show that by the year 2020, it could be the leading <coughs> cause of global disease, globally. So depression is going up. What's happened in the last 10 years or so that that we're seeing kind of an increase in that depression and suicidal ideation. Economy, housing, you know, the housing market, everything. And all the war, the terrorism, all these things. A lot of people we're finding in our outpatient clinics, uh, a lot more just regular old middle class folk coming in because they've lost their house, they've lost their job. They're getting ready to lose their family. So with an ACE score of seven, that correlated with a 51-fold increase in suicide attempts in children and adolescents. And in adults, um, there was a 30-fold increase in suicide attempts. So the higher the ACE score, you see a pattern here? <laughs> the higher the ACE score, the higher the trauma that you have gone through in your life, the more likely you are to have this stuff affect you. The other kind of interesting thing is ACEs a high ACE score apparently does maintain smoking behavior. And I'm not judging anybody, don't get me wrong. I struggle with that myself. So, but an ACE score <coughs> over or more resulted in 206% more likely to have COPD. Did you know that 43% of the cigarettes sold in the United States are sold to someone with a mental health diagnosis? It was kind of a casual study that was done, so that's probably, again, a higher number than that. So trauma, historically we've kind of assumed that trauma issues are secondary to the mental health or addictions or homeless issue, right? Maybe it's the central issue. Maybe it's the problem that everything else has um, come out of. So thinking, just kind of changing our thinking. I'm a nurse, so I think about universal precautions. And we need to presume that the individuals that we serve do have a history of traumatic stress and exercise those universal precautions by creating these systems of care that are very trauma-informed and trauma-savvy. The effects of trauma in individuals we serve, like I said, we're going to look at the biological, neurological, social, and emotional effects. In the brain, you know, our brain is um, ever-changing, growing, new neural pathways, that kind of thing. And depending on how severe, whether it's ongoing, how old you were, and when this major trauma happened. And most of our folks, it's kind of this ongoing recurring trauma. Uh, trauma. trauma. <laughs> <laughs> but we actually see in imaging changes in the brain neurobiology of folks with trauma, and I'll show you that. There's very clearly social, emotional, and cognitive impairment, <clears throat> and then we see a lot of unhealthy coping strategies that come out of that. 
That's where the smoking kind of comes in and then self-medicating with other things. Severe and persistent health and social problems, like I said, including early death, and lots of um, relationship issues with difficulty. So let's think about it together. Let's I keep going behind. I'm taking a video tape. Let's think about the human stress response to an acute threat. What's happening? Okay. If somebody just slammed that door really hard and loud, what would happen? You jump. Yeah. They're going to react. You're not going to think about, I'm going to jump out of my seat and jump under the table. You just do it. We get hypervigilant. What was that? Where's the threat? Right? <coughs> so we're not thinking very clearly. In the acute stress response, you become hypervigilant. You're not thinking very clearly. It's about action, not thought, sometimes even speechless terror. Um, we're going to have increased aggression because we're ready to fight, fly, or freeze. Some people freeze, and so I like to call it fight, fly, or freeze. And there's just a real loss of impulse control. That's in just one acute stress response. This is what's happening physiologically. Okay? We've had increased heart rate, which increases our blood pressure, and our respirations. There's a flood of cortisol and adrenaline going through to our brain and through our bodies. And that way we can have muscle tone to fight. And we tune out all non-critical information. We're really focused on the threat. So if, even if somebody's saying to me, yelling at me, it's okay, it's okay, I'm not hearing that. I hear something that sounds like a gunshot, and I'm under the table, and I'm going to stay there. So think about what happens with our folks that have this kind of reaction to the world around them because of trauma all the time. What's happening? Why do you think there's physical... Um, medical issues, because their central nervous system was reset, never quite getting back to that resting state. Always had a little bit of increased blood pressure, increased jet adrenaline, increased cortisol being pumped out. And that aggression begins to become chronic. As they get stuck in this traumatic reenactment, and basically what that means is it's an inability to learn new expectations for certain situations. And when we get to my very rudimentary brain, slide, we'll talk about that a little more. We become chronically hyper-aroused or hyper-vigilant. And that, we just found out, interferes with cognitive clarity, right? Not thinking, you're acting. And there's a loss or failure to develop kind of their own affect modulation. I have, I want to spend some time on hypervigilance because I, I think we, we know that term, we use it. Let's think about it. Let's think about what's happening living that way, which most of our folks are in this, especially homeless, right? Survival mode, in that kind of chronic hyperarousal, always checking things out. So what's happening with hypervigilance? Basically, it's an enhanced state of sensory sensitivity. Everything, noise, light, sound, smell, touch, is really exaggerated, okay? And then there's an exaggerated <coughs> intensity of our inerrant behaviors to reduce the threat or detect threats around us, that hyper, you know, just scanning. Then we have increased anxiety with that hypervigilance, and that enhances sensory sensitivity even more. So these people are, I'm exhausted just thinking about living that way, just constantly looking over your shoulder, wondering, fearful, right? And you know the other symptoms, that real abnormally increased arousal, that startle response that folks have. You may just say, hey, how you doing? And they get real, whew, real high responsiveness to stimuli and that constant scanning of the environment for threats. It can cause exhaustion. So we've got folks who have maybe thought disorders, um, mania, whatever the, the diagnosis. And then on top of that, we've got these trauma responses going wild. So, the amygdala, everybody know what that is? What's the other name for that? The reptilian brain. It is the oldest part of our brain. It sits right back here. It helps us to fight, flee, or freeze. And it's basically called the fear center of the brain. People with a history of trauma have a very active overactive amygdala. <coughs>